Open your Bibles, if you would please, first of all, to Hebrews chapter 11. I want you to find Hebrews chapter 11. I want you to mark that. And then we're going to turn to Judges chapter 6. Hebrews 11, then Judges chapter 6. Continuing the series of Trust and Obey, looking tonight at trust and obey, or trusting and obeying the making of God's hero, the making of God's hero. Simple truth, simple thought, trust and obey. And the more I preach on this, the more I study this, and the more I think about it, boy, that's just really what it comes down to, just the Christian life, trust and obey. Uh, we just trust God for what he says and what he's done and what he wants to do, and then obey and allow him to do that. Though that's something easily said to trust and obey, it's something hard to do because we don't trust, we lack in our faith. We need to grow in that, and then in obedience is sometimes a struggle as well. So looking tonight at the making of God's hero by trusting and obeying. Hebrews chapter 6, I'm sorry, Judges chapter 6, then we'll jump back to Hebrews 11. Judges chapter 6, very familiar passage. We don't have time for the whole story, but we'll be talking about it. So if you don't know the story of Gideon, I challenge you to go back and read it and reread it uh, the, later this week. Judges chapter 6, verse number 1. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian seven years. Let me just pause there again. I'm not sure what's being preached much out there, but God deals with his people when they do wrong. When God's people do wrong, God deals with them, not in hatred, not in anger, but in, in the desire for them to be right and to bring them back to him as we see that and so we must consider what's going on in our country, also a, a call to us. Verse number two, and the head of Midian prevailed against Israel and because the Midianites, the children of Israel, made them dens which are in the mountains and caves and strongholds. And so it was, when Israel had sown, that the Midianites came up, and the Amalekites, and the children of the east, even they came up against them. And they encamped against them, and destroyed the increase of the earth, till thou come to Gaza, and left no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep, nor ox, nor ass. For they came up with their cattle and their tents, and they came as grasshoppers for multitude, for both they and their camels were without number, and they entered into the land to destroy it. And Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites, and the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. Verse number 11. And there came an angel of the Lord, and sat under an oak, which was in Orpheth, and that pertaineth unto Joash the Esbarite, and that his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thy mighty man of valor. And Gideon said unto him, O my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us, and where be all his miracles which our fathers told us of, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us and delivered us into the hand of the Midianites. And the Lord looked down upon him and said, Go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? And he said unto him, O my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. Hebrews chapter 11. And in verse 32, And what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, and of Barak, and of Samson, and of Jethna, of David also, and Samuel, and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Let's pray. Father, I ask you to help us tonight. Lord, help us realize how true your word is and why you've preserved certain parts of it 
for us many generations later to read and to study as an example, as an encouragement, as a guidepost for us. So God, I ask that you help me, first of all, in my heart and my life tonight, that as I look at these things, that I would be encouraged, that I would be strengthened, that I would be built up, Lord, to accomplish the things you'd have us to accomplish as a church. But Lord, in every household, in every home, that you would do a mighty work tonight, that we'd make some decisions, that we'd be prepared, that we might be all that you would have us to be. Help us tonight, we ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Looking at the making of God's hero. Now, we often think about heroes, and we all have our own thoughts and our own ideas about heroes, and you may have a childhood hero, and it may have been the Lone Ranger or something along those lines, but we look at heroes. Hebrews 11 gives us a long list of God's heroes. God interprets hero as something different than us. In fact, if you look down there at verse number 32 I just read, it says, and what shall I more say? After all those people that he listed as his heroes, those that have accomplished great things for him, he said, for time would fail me to tell of Gideon, and that's who we just spoke about, of Barak and of Samson and of Jethro, of David also and Samuel, and of the prophets. So looking first of all, just to help us understand about God's heroes, not all are famous. Not all of God's heroes are famous. In fact, most are not. And that's why there at the end he says, and of the prophets. He didn't list their names. He didn't identify them. And he goes on later and talks about some of the trials they had. But not all heroes, not all heroes of God, if you will, are famous and well-known and have their names listed. We'll never know till we get to heaven the real heroes of God. So first of all, understand they're not all famous. Number two, they're not all earth-changing events. Uh, he just lays out the prophets. We don't know most heroes. We don't read about. We don't know about what they went on in their life. God knows about it. God's got it written down. God's got it uh, preserved. But it's not all earth-changing events, but they're still God's heroes. But I want you to notice also, lest you think it could not be you, we see that God's heroes were not all perfect people. They were far from it. I mean, we look at that little list. He says, what shall we say more? Should, uh, time would fail me to tell of Gideon. Gideon was not perfect. Of Barak, he was certainly not perfect. Samson, we know his issues uh, with, uh, with, with the ladies. And of Jethna, he's the one that made the, the silly vow about uh, cost of his daughter's life. And so they're not all perfect. So when you and I look at that, you say, well, I could never be a hero of God. Yes, we can. Because a hero of God doesn't mean we're perfect. It doesn't mean we're doing, that God has necessarily given us a job to change the world, that God has given us a job or a position where everybody's going to know about us. Maybe nobody does, but God does. So a hero of God is one who's just doing their best to obey God, to follow God, and accomplish God's will in their lives. And we can all do that. You say, well, I've got some issues in the past. That's all right. You can still be a hero of God. You say, well, I've got some, uh, some fears and some doubts. We'll see that tonight. We don't have to be perfect, but God wants us to be heroes, and we're going to find the key to being a hero is trust and obey, just simply trusting and obeying. That little phrase that the series is based upon, it comes from that song we often sing about, trust and obey, for there's no other way. The song says to be happy in Jesus, but to be anything in the Lord is trusting and obeying. So we know it's a children's lesson, but it's every Christian's lesson, every church's lesson and command to trust and obey. We see God's heroes here, and we're looking at Gideon tonight about how he was, became a hero of God by simply trusting and obeying. So when we talk about being heroes, it's not to pat ourselves on the back. Listen carefully. It's not to make us feel good. It's to be used of God. It's all for God's glory. It's all for God's purpose and us to be God's men and women that he can use. And so looking tonight, it's just a decision we have to make. I'm going to trust and obey. Trust and obey. We usually, in the big picture of things, though at the time it doesn't seem big but or does seem big to us, but we struggle and take that thing lightly. Uh, trust and obey, okay, tithing. Okay, well, let's just trust and obey. Uh, church attendance, just trust and obey. Going soul winning, trusting and obeying. Uh, be, being in the family structures, we're supposed to trust and obey. All things, those little things, what we might call little things in our Christian life, trust and obey. But when you get down to it, in the case of Gideon and others, the trust and obey has bigger ramifications. It has bigger 
issues associated with it. It's got more, more on the line, if you will, some higher stakes than the, what we would normally think, just the little day-to-day -day mundane things of trusting and obeying. We think of the fact that here is Gideon, he's putting his life on the line by trusting and obeying. We think of Daniel in this prayer. He put his life on the line to trust and obey. We think of the Hebrew children, which we studied not too long ago. They went into the fire by trusting and obeying. We're talking about putting their life on the line. We're talking about putting their testimony on the line. Trust and obey. In fact, in Acts chapter 4 and Acts chapter 5, the early New Testament church, it came to the place where they had to trust and obey. And it really put them on the spot. It really put them in danger. So it may well be that God has raised up Lighthouse Baptist Church, raised up you as part of our church to, to, for this particular time in our nation to trust and obey and be willing to stand for God and be a hero for God. And it all comes down to just trusting and and obeying. It says as in the early Testament, or New Testament church in Acts 4, it talks about we ought to obey God rather than men. It came down to that place where it says we have to trust, we just have to obey God. That's trust and obey. They had been threatened to be beaten. They had been threatened within, with other issues, but they says, no, we, we ought to obey God rather than men. Later on in chapter 5, it says we ought to obey God rather than men. He said, you choose that. So we have to live our lives and decide tonight that in all aspects, Large and small, I just want to trust and obey. And by doing that, then that builds the courage. It helps us accomplish what God wants us to accomplish in our lives by trusting and obeying, being truthful to ourselves and to God and His Word. So tonight we're looking at Gideon, truly a hero. But let's see how trusting and obeying brings us to the place of being a hero for God and a hero of God. Again, not necessarily world known, not to pat ourselves on the back, not to change, just God says, well done, thy good and faithful servant. That is a hero. So we're looking tonight about how trusting obey helps us accomplish those things God wants us to do. How simply deciding tonight to trust and obey and making that a decision in our life, making that a cardinal point in our life, a focus in our life to trust and obey, how that puts us in a position to be made a hero of God. So I hope you're with me very quickly tonight, just a few points, but it's, it's vital that we understand this. It's vital I understand it for the times that we're in. Number one, trusting and obeying helps us overcome our feelings. Trusting and obeying helps us overcome our feelings. We live in a society, which I guess has always been that way, where we live our life based upon our feelings. We, we must not live our life based upon feeling. Our feelings will lie to us. Our feelings will take us in the wrong direction. We're to live by the Spirit of God. We're to live by God's Word. We're to live by God's principles. We're to let character and the principles of God and the Spirit of God control our lives, not our feelings. Because our feelings will prevent us from doing what we ought to do. It's been said many times, feelings follow actions. So you say, well, I'm not sure. No, you just, just do it, and pretty soon you will feel like it. So we have to understand to trust and obey, basically tonight, no matter what we feel. So trust and obeying, listen, by making the decision to simply trust and obey, that helps me overcome my feelings that would keep me from being a hero of God, that would keep me from accomplishing what God wants me to do. So let's look at Gideon tonight and see how trusting, obeying, helped him overcame, overcome his feelings. Notice, first of all, he felt oppressed. He felt oppressed. Have you ever been hindered in your work for God and hindered as a parent or hindered as a spouse because you felt oppressed, the oppression of the wicked one, the oppression of the devil, the oppression of our enemy, just oppressed, and you get discouraged and you get down? That's where Gideon was. And God had a great plan for him, but we find it didn't change his feelings until after he trusted and obeyed. He had those feelings, but God gave him the command, and he simply had to trust and obey. Notice his, how, why, how he felt oppressed. Verses 1 through 4, we just read it, but let's look at it again of, of Judges chapter 6. He felt oppressed. It says, And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian seven years. So this was an oppression going on for seven years. And had a Midian prevailed against Israel, 
And because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made them the dens, which are in the mountains, and caves and strongholds. So they're living in the wilderness. They're living in caves. They're afraid and hiding. And it was so that when Israel had sown, so they sowed their crops, they laid out their gardens, they got their food ready. The Midianites came up, and Amalekites, and the children of the east, and even came up against them. And they encamped against them and destroyed the increase of the earth till they came to Gaza and left no substance for Israel, neither sheep, nor ox, nor ass. So they were coming and they were overtaking. They took away their food, they took away their animals. Every year it's harvest time, they would come in and just take from them. So they could not feed themselves. They could not take care of themselves. They could not act. And so we find that when the angel came and said, Thy mighty man of valor, he said, If God be for us, he says, Then why does all this happen? He just felt oppressed. He was, he was out hiding behind the wine press, threshing his wheat because he would, just didn't want it to be stolen. Ladies and gentlemen, sometimes you and I, we, we feel oppressed. We feel the oppression of God, or of the devil. We feel the oppression of, of the world down on us, and we get discouraged, and we get down in, in, the, in, the, in the mully grubs, and down in the dumps, and get down, and we just can't do what God wants to do. He said, well, I just don't feel like I just feel so oppressed. That's when we must decide, I'm just going to trust and obey. In spite of the fact that I feel oppressed, God knows my feelings, and so I just need to trust and obey. Not only did he feel oppressed, but he felt overwhelmed. He felt overwhelmed. Verse number five, for they came up with their cattle and their tents, and they came as grasshoppers for multitude. <laughs> he said they were without number. It wasn't just a little band here. It wasn't just a little crowd over here oppressing them. He was just overwhelmed. He was just completely surrounded. Israel was just surrounded completely. They couldn't count them. Do you ever feel that way? You can't count your problems? I mean, you got so many problems, so many difficulties, so many people against you, so many situations against you, you can't even begin to count them. That's what it was. So he felt overwhelmed. So he felt oppressed, and he felt overwhelmed. The word overwhelmed there simply, when I say that, I'm talking about being confused by pressure and questions. You just get confused with the pressure and questions. Just overwhelmed. I can't think right. I can't decide right. I can't plan right. My mind is just in a fog. Have you ever been there? That's why, listen carefully, when you feel oppressed and you're mind is messed up, and your heart's messed up, when we feel overwhelmed and we can't think clearly, that's when we have to have already set up, I'm going to just trust and obey. Why? Because <laughs> it's the only way. I'm not sure how to go. I'm not sure what I should do. My reasoning's not right, but God's reasoning is always right. I'm going to trust and obey. In fact, in 1 Peter chapter 2, it says, Wherefore also it is contained in the Scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. And so we won't be confounded. We won't be overturned. We won't be that if we just trust in God, rely on God, believe on God. So he felt overwhelmed. By the way, when we've got God on our side, or we're on God's side, I guess the best way to put it, we're not outnumbered. We are not outnumbered. If you just count on the digits, yes, but when it comes to power, we are not outnumbered. In fact, you know the story in 2 Kings chapter 6. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, a host compassed the city both with horses and chariots. So the enemy was coming to capture Elijah, and his servant went out early in the morning, and boy, they were just surrounded. And the servant said to him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? And he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountains full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. Wow. That young man thought he was overwhelmed. He said, we're out overwhelmed and we're outnumbered. He says, well, Elisha said, no, not when God's here. Not when God's here. Trust and obey. Trust and obey. It helps us overcome our feelings. He felt oppressed. He felt overwhelmed very quickly. He felt abandoned. He felt abandoned and alone. Look at verse number 12. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thy mighty man of valor. And Gideon said unto him, O my Lord, if the Lord be with us. He said, You said he's with us, but he said, I don't see it. 
Why then is all this befallen us? And where be all his miracles, which our fathers told us of, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us and delivered us into the hand of the Midianites. He said, God's forsaken us. He's left us. He said, you said he's with us, but I don't feel it. You said he's with us, but I don't see it. You said he's with us. He said, but I don't. He felt abandoned and alone. Have you ever felt that way? Just abandoned, just by yourself. Like nobody really cares. Like God really is not on the throne, that God's not really working. And he had these feelings. That's why he was out behind the wine press hiding it. That's why when the angel said, God's going to use you, he says, I don't even know that God's with us. And where are all the miracles? So he's just abandoned us. I'd say he had an attitude. Boy, he had an attitude. Why? Because his feelings, his feelings had oppressed him. His feelings had directed him. His feelings were pulling him down. So he felt abandoned and alone. Not only that, he felt unqualified. He felt unqualified. You say, what are you talking about? Notice what he said. When he says, I'm going to use you. Verse number 15, and he said unto him, O my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh. He says, I'm not, I can't do this. I'm not qualified to do this. He said, my family is a poor family. and My family is just kind of the lower rung and the children of Israel. And behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am in the least in my father's house. He said, I can't, you God, you're calling me to, to deliver Israel. He says, who am I? He says, I'm not qualified. I come from a runt tribe, and I'm the runt of a runt family inside the runt tribe. He said, we are too poor. I can't do that. Boy, did you ever feel unqualified to what God has asked you to do? Did you ever feel like you just weren't able to do that? That's a feeling we had. He didn't feel like he was qualified to go to battle. He didn't feel like he was qualified to take a stand. He didn't feel like he was qualified to take the first move. Ladies and gentlemen, if we're going to be heroes of God, not world-renowned, not patting ourselves on the back, but used of God where God can say, well done, thy good and faithful servant, and maybe just be listed there as, as of the prophets, we have to say, I may feel unqualified, but God equips those that he calls. And so when God calls us, we know that he will equip us, whether it's to go to battle, whether it's to take a stand, whether to make the first move. But, but I feel so unqualified. All right, how do you defeat that feeling of unqualified? Trust and obey. God says, I'm going to use you, Gideon. He said, I don't feel qualified. He said, just trust me and obey. But I feel overwhelmed and oppressed. Then just trust me and obey. Jeremiah 1. Jeremiah had that same initial feeling of being unqualified. By the way, without God, we are unqualified. But with God, we are qualified. In Jeremiah, when God called him, then said I, ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak. He's calling to be a preacher, a prophet. He said, I cannot speak, for I am a child. But the Lord said unto him, Say not, I am a child. For thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. So he said, I'm going to use you, Jeremiah. He said, I can't, I'm just a child. God says, don't say that. He said, I'm going to give you the words, and I'm going to be with you, and I'm going to do the work. You just have to trust and obey. So, trust and obey. How does that help us be heroes of God, as in case of Gideon? It helps us overcome our feelings. Tonight, you may have feelings of ineptness. You may have feelings of being overwhelmed. You may have feelings of being oppressed. You may have feelings of being unqualified, and we all do. But you say, you know, God's called me, God's chosen me, God's commanded me, and so I'm just going to trust and obey. Wow. So trust and obey, it helps us overcome our feelings. Number two, trusting and obeying helps us overcome our fears. It helps us overcome our fears by building our faith. In other words, to be a hero of God, I need to trust and obey regardless of my feelings. I need to trust and obey regardless of my fears. God will help build our faith. We have to trust and obey even though we are afraid, and God will build our fears, build our faith through our fears. And we're going to see that here in the life of Gideon very quickly. God builds our faith through our fears by his speech by his speech, by his words, by the words God gives us, by the words God commands us. Look at verse number 16. Okay, verse 15, he says, Gideon says, I can't. He said, I'm, I'm, I'm not qualified. I come from a poor family. I'm the smallest. I'm just not qualified to do that. 
Verse 16, God's response. And the Lord said to him, Surely I will be with thee. Thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. And so God is now encouraging him. He's trying to build his faith in spite of his fears by his speech and by his words. I like that where he says, Surely I will be with thee. I like that. Surely. He said, For sure. Don't you fret, don't you worry, for sure I will be with you. For sure I will give you the words. For sure I will give you the victory. For sure. And so we find God helps build our faith through our fears by God's speech, by God's word. In other words, by the word of God, by the preaching of God's word, by the speaking of the Holy Spirit to us. You say, but I'm afraid. Trust and obey anyway. That God can build our faith through our fears even as he will through his word. Notice he builds, he builds our faith through our fears by his speech. First of all, regarding his presence. Regarding his presence. Verse 16, the Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with thee. So I'm not sending you by yourself. I'll be with you. I'll be with you. Boy, that'll build our faith. We know God is with us. Hebrews 13, 5, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear what man shall do unto me. So God basically in the Old Testament said, I'm going to be with you, don't be afraid, I'm going to be with you. Let me give you my word, I promise, I will be with you. And so we don't have to fear what man can do. So God builds our faith. Through our fears, by his speech, recognizing, regarding his presence, regarding his power. God says he's going to deliver them into his hand. God's going to give them the victory. And then very quickly, notice, regarding Gideon's perception. Gideon's perception. As I was looking at this and studying about that, that helped me so much. I hope it will help you. Notice what he says. Verse 16, the Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. As one man. He says, get the big picture, Gideon. Here's the idea. Gideon was looking at the crowd without number, like grasshoppers. God says, no, he says, look at it as one man. Us against him. Not you against one, two, three, four, five, six, ten million. Get the right perspective. Keep the big picture. One job. So many times we, we're afraid because we see so many aspects of the job, so many aspects of the call, so many what ifs, no, so many what ifs. He God says, no, just trust and obey and look at it as one job, one call, and just do it. He said, as one man. He says, get the picture, get the focus, get the perspective like I do. I've got this job for you to do. So when we go out, yes, there's maybe many little tasks we need to do, but we need to realize, whoa, God's called me to do a job, a job, and God's got it planned and God will do it. And so God then teaches us that we build our faith through our fears by his speech as he teaches us from his word about his presence, about God's power, and getting the right perspective. Very quickly, God helps build our faith through our fears by his signs, by his signs. Now, I'm not a big one on signs, but in Gideon's case, God helped him out by giving him some signs. Aren't you glad God sometimes gives us some signs? Well, God doesn't give me any signs. He gave you a book full right here. A book full right here. Oh, we won't take the so many aspects of those signs. Everything, let's, let's just pick one. Verse number 20. Verse number 18. Well, verse, verse number 17. Genesis 1, 1. No, right there in verse 17. And he said unto him, If now I have found grace in thy sight, then show me a sign that thou talkest with me. Isn't that amazing? He's sitting there talking to the guy. He's saying, Prove to me you're talking to me. He says, Depart not hence, I pray thee, till I come unto thee, and bring forth my present, and set it before thee. And he said, I will tarry till thou come again. And Gideon went in and made ready a kid, and unleavened cakes of an ephah of flour, and flesh he put in a basket, and he put the broth in a pot, and brought it out unto him under the oak, and presented it. And the angel of God said unto him, Take the flesh and the unleavened cakes, and lay them upon this rock, and pour out the broth. And he did so. And the angel of the Lord 
put forth the end of the staff that was in his hand and touched the flesh and the unleavened cakes. And there rose up a fire out of the rock and consumed the flesh and the unleavened cakes. And the angel of the Lord departed out of his sight. One of the things God helped build his faith through, over through his fears by his signs was he led him into powerful and acceptable worship. One of the first things he said, let me show you. You want a sign? You want a, show, a sign I'm with you? You want a sign that this is true? You want a sign that I'm speaking to you? He said, let me show you about worship. Let me show you about accepting your worship. Let me show you about some powerful worship as he offered there in the fire I came out of the rock and consumed it. Ladies and gentlemen, if we can just understand it, if we can just get our worship right with God, God wants to show us, God wants to build our faith, God wants to help overcome our fears by having some powerful and acceptable worship with Him. We so often want to run out and do the job without getting the worship done, but the first sign He got, He said, give me a sign, show me, prove me. He said, all right, let me show you about real, acceptable, and powerful worship. Oh, then he goes on through so many other areas of giving the signs with the fleece and the water and the on the ground and the dew. Let's just understand God helps build our faith through our fears with his signs, by his speech, and also through gradual steps. Through gradual steps. Well, as you study the life of Gideon, just like when you study the life of Abraham, God builds our faith a step at a time, a step at a time. He didn't say, okay, Gideon, here's your first job. I know you're afraid. I know you're lacking in faith. Let me build your faith and help you overcome your fear. You can now go out and attack those 10,000, those 100,000 people. No. Took him a step at a time, gradual steps. His first step was he asked him to just take a position. Stake out a position in a relationship with God. Verse 23. Back at the verse 22. And when Gideon perceived that it was an angel of the Lord, Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for, behold, for because I have seen an angel of the Lord face to face. And the Lord said unto him, Peace be unto thee, fear not, thou shalt not die. Then Gideon built an altar there unto the Lord and called it Jehovah Salom unto this day was yet in Orpheth of the Abazarites first thing he did was he staked out a position in a relationship with God. See, his daddy, we'll see, had many altars, had altars to other gods. Israel had fallen away from God. So the very first step, if you will, of faith was to set up his own altar. His very first step was, okay, I'm identifying myself as belonging to God. I'm identifying my relationship with God. I'm identifying the fact that I worship the one true God. You say, preacher, where's the first step of faith I need to take? Just acknowledge who you are, that you belong to God. Just acknowledge the fact that you're worshiping God. Just take a stand in a position that you are God's. Don't worry so much about the third step and the fourth step and the fifth step. Take that one. The problem is we never get that tied down that we belong to God. And we're serving the one true holy God. And then we wonder why we struggle with those other steps. Let's get that one down first. Just stake a position and a relationship with God. Oh, we need to do that. Very quickly, he helps build our faith through our fears in gradual steps. Staking out a position. Number two, starting with a little night job. Starting with a little night job. Verse 24, he built an altar to God. Verse number 25, and it came to pass the same night that the Lord said unto him, well, see, you take a first step, God says, yeah, let's take another. You take the next step, he says, God, let's take another. He said, I'm going to work with you. So he built an altar. He said, all right, I'm going to worship God. I'm going to stake myself. I'm identifying with the Jehovah God, the God of our Father. That same night, and it came to pass that same night, the Lord said to him, take thy father's young bullock, even the second bullock of seven years, and throw down the altar of Baal, which thy father hath, and cut down the grove that is by it. So he sent him on a little night job. He said, tonight, he said, I'll give you a job. Go do that. Yeah, you could tell he was afraid because he went out at night. In fact, the Bible says he went out that night. He took in his crowd, and they went out at night. Maybe it doesn't tell us the hour. It could have been 2 o'clock. But he said, all right, guys, we're going to tear down Daddy's altar. But I'm scared to death, so we're going to do it at night when nobody's around and nobody can see us and nobody can recognize it. But it was a step, a little night job. He said, yeah, go tear down the altar. God didn't require him to do it at high noon. He didn't require him to blow trumpets. He said, go do it. He took that little step. So he built his faith. Through his fears. He was a fearful man. Step at a time. Staking a position. Starting with a little night job. And then, of course, that great passage where it talks about progression. Progression of faith. 
Judges chapter 7. For the sake of time, we won't read it. But he took him through some steps. Gideon got his, his army together. And God says, you got too many. You got too many. He said, if you got so many, if you go have a victory now, you'll think that you did it, and you won't know that I did it. He said, so to everybody that's afraid to go home. So he said, all right, everybody's afraid to go home. Most of them went home. You didn't have to accept that. I'm not sure what Gideon was thinking, but he's that fearful man, and he's out there again, and he said, oh, I just lost a bunch. Okay. If you ever been that way, you just have to kind of take a breath and say, all right. Okay, it's still okay. I'm still with, like Brother Fisher, you know, he'd be preaching sometimes those hard messages, and he'd stop and say, are we still okay? You'd say, yeah, okay. Tell everybody it's afraid to go home. Crowds, crowds went home. He said, okay. Then God said, you still got too many. And you know the story, he says, take them down, get them a drink. Those that take water by their hand and lap it like this, so their heads are up. Mark those, and you'll take those. Those that just go dump, put their face right in the water, he says, you leave those behind. And he was down to 300. Take that step at a time. Progression. You start with a big crowd. First, he had to give them enough courage to go gather the crowd. Then he had to take some of the crowd away. He said, you still all right? Yeah, okay. Okay, down to, down to 300. Okay. Boy, if you know the story, then he went down there. And he got down to the enemy. And God says, I want you to go down and listen to what they're going to tell you. I want you to sneak down there tonight. He said, your enemy's down there. I want you to sneak down and listen to something. He says, but if you're afraid, if you're afraid to go, take your servant. Guess what? He took the servant because <laughs> he was afraid. And he went down there, which was a fearful thing for him, a progression. Big crowd, smaller crowd, 300, then just him and his servant down there near the enemy. Whoa, progression. God builds our faith through our fears by progression. Where are you hung up tonight? What part of God's progression of trust and obey are you hung up? Where have you stopped? Where have you said no? Is it just maybe the very first step? He said, God wants you to build an altar. He said, I want you to identify yourself as mine. I want you to identify yourself as a Christian. I want you to take that very first step of saying you belong to me. You know, I can't do that. God's got so much more. But we have to take that first step. It may be that first little job God wants you to do. I don't know what it is. But don't be up. Lastly, we find God builds our faith through our fears by grand successes. By grand successes. Oh, for the sake of time, it's just in your notes there. They won. And they chased them out of the valley. Great victory out of the, th from with Gideon's 300, over thousands and thousands, and put it in the flight and chased them. A great victory, a great success. And now Gideon is now chasing them over the next county and chasing them. Boy, now he's on fire. Why? Because that great success that God worked, a miracle of God that night in the enemy, that propelled him to the next great step. What a wonderful thing. But the great success did not come until way back here with the, after the very first step where he says, okay, build an altar. He said, I, gave, I built an altar. He said, now I want you to tear down your daddies. I'll let you do it at night. So he tore down his daddies. He said, now I got your army together. He said, now let's take it down. No, you got too many. Smaller yet. No, smaller yet. Now I want you to go down there by yourself. But if you have to, take your friend with you, your servant, and go down. He did that. Boy, then God brought a great success, and that propelled him even farther. But the idea is Gideon's faith, the hero of God, trust and obey in spite of his fears, in spite of his feelings, just by trust and obey, and God progressed him through those. Wow, anybody can do it. Gideon was a fearful thing. Gideon was a, the runt tribe, a runt inside the runt family of the runt tribe of Israel, and a fearful man. Yet God made him a hero by just trust and obey. He was afraid, but he obeyed. He was fearful, but he obeyed. If you're afraid to go down there, take a friend. He said, I'll go, but I'm afraid. It's just trust and obey. Trust and obey to overcome our feelings so we get used of God. Trust and obey to overcome our fears so we get used of God. And here's one that may be the hardest. Trusting and obeying to help us endure our fatigue. Trust and obey to help us endure our fatigue. Judges 8, verse number 4. He's got him on the run now. 
and they're running. So they've, they've established the battle. They let the folks go home. He got down to 300. They went down that night, had the battle, had the battle plan, had the victory, began to chase him in verse number four. And Gideon came to Jordan. They're passing him now. They're chasing him out of the country, going after him, going to make a, even a greater victory. And Gideon came to Jordan and passed over. He and all 300 men that were with him, faint, yet pursuing them. They were wore out. They were tired. Faint, not just kind of, well, I'm kind of weary. It's been a long day. No, they were, they were fainting. They were weak. They were getting tired, yet pursuing. How in the world can we go on when we feel like we can't go anymore? By trusting and obeying. Have you got the idea? It's simple. Yeah, I, I don't feel like it. That's right, but I'm going to trust and obey. But I'm afraid. That's right, but I'm going to trust and obey. I'm tired, but we need to trust and obey. That little key, that little song, that little truth we teach children, and I hope you're teaching your children, trust and obey. That provides us the vehicle. Galatians 6, 9 says, let us not be weary in well-doing. Oh, so often we get weary in well-doing. We just get tired of working. We just get tired of doing even what's right. He says, don't get that way. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Isaiah 40, verse 28. Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard, that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not. By the way, I'm glad God doesn't faint. <laughs> God does not faint. Fainteth not, neither is weary. He said, God doesn't get tired. There is no searching of his understanding. He, God, giveth power, the one who does not faint, the one who does not get weary, he giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increases strength. He that never gets weary, he that never faints, says, that's all right, I'll give you the energy, I'll give you the strength, I'll give you what I never run out of, and you do. So the key is to be this hero of God, to be the one God can use, trust and obey. Faint, yet pursuing. Trust and obey no matter what. Trust and obey no matter how I feel. Trust and obey no matter what I fear. Trust and obey no matter my fatigue. Wow. Wow even of the prophets. Let's decide tonight not to pat ourselves on the back, but to hear, well done, thy good and faithful servant, to be one of the unnamed in God's list of heroes by trusting and obeying in spite of our feelings, in spite of our fears, in spite of our fatigue. Trust and obey. Let's bow our heads, please. Every head bowed, every eye closed. We have no idea what the battles lay ahead of us. We're unusual times of our nation, unusual times in the world. We've had it so easy as Christians. But the key is just trust and obey, whether it would be as Daniel, whether it be as David, whether it be as Gideon, Trust and obey as the piano.